Neil Ferguson, in your new book, you open up with this sentence. The suspicion grows that the world is controlled by powerful and exclusive networks. The bankers, the establishment, the system, the Jews, the Freemasons, the Illuminati, nearly all that is written in this vein is rubbish. What, what, what are you getting at here? What, what's the point? There is a whole genre, let's just call it conspiracy theory, out there. Uh, some of it's in the bookshops, more of it is online, and you'll find it if you just type in any of those uh, names as a search item, the Illuminati. If you type in the Illuminati, you'll be taken into a, a wonderful world of conspiracy theory in which a secret organization dating back to the 1770s controls the world controls the Federal Reserve, controls the Trump administration. And there are all kinds of variations on this theme. I've been writing about social networks much of my career. I wrote a book about the Rothschild Bank, or banks, uh, controlled by one of the most successful Jewish banking families of the 19th century. There are conspiracy theories about the Rothschilds that match up with the Illuminati conspiracy theories. Or suppose you want the Freemasons of the American Revolution, I have a conspiracy theory for that too. The interesting thing about this genre, which is very popular and to which a great many Americans uh, subscribe in one form or another, is that none of it is written by professional historians. It's a kind of genre that looks like history and usually involves some historical narrative, but it, it's nearly always detached from any scholarship. There's uh, fake history as well as fake news, and most conspiracy theory history is, is fake history. This makes it very difficult for the professional historian to write about these subjects. I mean, who wants to write about the Illuminati if most that is already out there is crazy stuff? And who wants to really talk about the Freemasons and the American Revolution? If you write about that, won't you just find yourself on the same shelf in the bookshop as the crazy books? So I've noticed over my career that these actually quite interesting and important subjects have been abandoned by professional historians and left to the cranks and the conspiracy theorists. And that's a pity, because there are stories to be told about all of them, about the Illuminati, about the Rothschilds. Uh, you name it, there, there is some history there, but it's just very different history from the conspiracy theories. And part of the point of the square and the tower is to say, we should be able to talk about these subjects without being classified with the, the cranks and the conspiracy theorists. Before we get too far into the book, let's catch up about you. I mean, you're well known in some circles in this country for things like the Ascent of Money uh, PBS uh, series, documentary series. What was that and when did you do it? Ten years ago, I, I published a book and produced a television series called The Ascent of Money, uh, a financial history of the world. And this series was designed to give people some historical context for the crisis that I saw coming. So in 2006 7 I was writing quite a lot about the coming financial crisis. What struck me when I would spend time on Wall Street was that the people who were running the investment banks knew no financial history beyond their own careers. Uh, they certainly weren't prepared for a financial crisis on the scale of 1929, which was what they got with the failure of Lehman Brothers. So I'm a great believer that historians can help us with the present and even with the futures that we contemplate. What I tried to do in The Ascent of Money was to say, look here, Wall Street, uh, the chances are very high that a major financial crisis will happen. That's what history leads us to expect. What can we learn about the financial system from history? I don't really understand anything till I know its history. That's how I operate. So I wanted to tell this, the story of money. Where do banks come from? What's the bond market? What's the stock market? Why do we buy houses with loans called mortgages? So I wrote a book that essentially gave the reader a sense of where the financial system came from and why it was very likely to suffer a major crisis. The crisis happened just after the book came out. It, I think Lehman went bust just a few weeks after the publication of the book, uh, which was interesting uh, and meant that I had at least something to say about what was happening in in real time as financial history was being made. Ten years later, this book is trying to do something similar for Silicon Valley. That is to say, I'm saying to Silicon Valley, history applies to you 
history didn't begin with the Google IPO or the founding of Facebook. History goes a long way back and it's relevant to you. But I'm also saying to, to readers interested in history, you know, network science is pretty important and historians need to understand it. And if you don't really understand how networks work, you will not only fail to understand the present, but you'll actually have some trouble understanding the past. So it's a bit like the ascent of money goes to Silicon Valley. That's a rough characterization of this book. And any of your viewers who enjoyed the ascent of money will, I, I hope, enjoy this book. Where did you grow up? In Glasgow in Scotland, you can tell from my odd accent that I'm from the British Isles, but I actually come from that peculiar part of the British Isles, Scotland, uh, which uh, uh, is, is one of those countries with a superiority complex rather than in, an inferiority complex. Most small countries have an inferiority complex, but the Scots uh, have long thought that they invented the modern world, that they run the United Kingdom, and that wherever they go, they will find traces of their forefathers' endeavours, including the United States, with its its many traces of Scottish influence. But that's that's where I I grew up, and I was encouraged to think that that Scotland had a special mission to transform the world. And what were your parents doing? My father was a doctor. My mother, uh, now retired, uh, is a physicist who taught physics. So I come from a relatively scientific uh, family. My sister is a professor of, uh, of physics at Yale. She's the clever one. I was the black sheep of the family in that I drifted into what some people think of as a social science and others think of as one of the humanities, history. Um, I, so I study uh, the strange particles called human beings and the way in which they behave. But I think my, my family uh, gave me a, a, a couple of advantages, at least two. One was a tendency to think about the world with the framework of the Scottish Enlightenment. Through my grandfathers, I was the heir of a certain intellectual legacy that goes back to Adam Smith and David Hume and the great thinkers of 18th century Scotland. Uh, and I think the other advantage that, uh, that they gave me was to, to think of, of history as a branch of literature. So there were history books in the house, but side by side with the great works of, of fiction. Uh, and so I was introduced at an early stage to the idea that, above all, history must be literature. Uh, it must be readable. A.J.P. Taylor was a historian that I remember uh, occupying some space on my parents' bookshelves. And that, that uh, inspired me to find uh, history attractive as an intellectual endeavor, but also as a, as a literary endeavor. Your <coughs> college education, how extensive was it and where was it? Well, extensive is a funny word to use because in some ways uh, an Oxford education is intensive. One, one <laughs> reads history. I spent three years as an undergraduate at Oxford reading history. Uh, that was a wonderful opportunity. I had grown up in Glasgow. To me, Oxford was nirvana, a kind of promised land uh, of not only stunning architecture, but also brilliant minds. I, I couldn't believe that it was possible to be employed to sit in a book-lined study and divide one's time between reading books, writing books, and talking about books with, with, with students. These Oxford dons, we would call them professors in the United States, seemed to me the luckiest human beings alive. And all I wanted to do once I saw their lifestyle was to have it myself, to, to have a lifetime spent in this realm of books. It was very inspiring to be at Oxford in the early 1980s for uh, another reason. Uh, Britain was in a great state of ferment. Margaret Thatcher was prime minister. Uh, most universities lent in uh, the direction of, of the left. Uh, to be pro-Thatcher was to be in uh, a minority, but we were, I, I became one of these young Thatcherites, we were a feisty minority who enjoyed uh, making the case for the, the Thatcher government. So I had a certain political education at Oxford as well as an academic education. And Oxford being Oxford, unlike American universities, there's only one exam, it's at the end. 
uh, finals. Everything hinges on that. What you do in the preceding years is kind of up to you. I didn't go to many lectures. In fact, I went to hardly any lectures. I did learn to play the double bass. I dabbled in student journalism. I found that I couldn't act. I tried pretty much everything except sport and found that I wasn't really that good at any of the things other than writing history essays. So at the final, in the final phase in the final year, I reverted back to being a historian just in time. When you're talking about networks in your book, Oxford is a network, Magdalen College, I would assume, is a network. Absolutely. There are some 35 colleges or more at, at Oxford. What does it mean for you that you were at Magdalen College inside Oxford, to as go, far as networking? Absolutely. To go to uh, Oxford and to go to one of the most prestigious, the most prestigious college, Magdalen, is to be admitted into the network of, of the British elite right there. The contemporaries that you meet uh, will include future leaders uh, who will include future editors. There's a sense in which Britain is still, as it has been for centuries, run by people who went to Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, you go to the Oxford Union, which is the debating society, what you're really seeing is students preparing for the House of Commons, practicing, getting the hang of standing at the dispatch box. And some of my near contemporaries have gone on to uh, great things. Uh, rather to my own incredulity, Boris Johnson is now the Foreign Secretary. Uh, that's not something I would have predicted uh, back then. It's probably something that he would have predicted. So I think Oxford uh, admits you to the network that is sometimes called the establishment, that still, to a surprising extent, runs Britain. I didn't really appreciate that at the time, I think. I, I only re retrospectively appreciate the extent to which that was admission into a very important network that extends into politics, uh, that extends into the media, and that extends into business. And that from that point onwards in your life, without even necessarily being aware of it, when you meet somebody at a cocktail party in London, a transaction occurs which goes like this. Oh, did you go to Oxford? Oh, which college? When were you there? Do you know X? Oh yes, I know Y. Now people who haven't been admitted to that network can't play that game. It's the central activity of, of social networks, exchanging information and building a uh, a connection that then has utility in the present. Because of course if you and I went to Magdalen, we have a set of common experiences and that builds a kind of trust. So the chances are that any future transaction that we embark on or project that we decide to do together will, will be based on that underlying mutual understanding. That's how social networks work. And Oxford introduced me to that, to that world. In your book, you talk about Oxford and how it relates to Cambridge. Um, I want to get back to this in a second. I want you to tell us about the apostles. Yes. But after you graduated and came to this country, how many different places have you taught in the United States? I first taught at New York University for a couple of years and then went to Harvard. And I was a professor at Harvard for 12 years and only recently moved to Stanford, so three. I've given multiple guest lectures here, there, and everywhere, but those three institutions are the ones where I've, I've spent time. So, who are, or were, or can be an apostle, and what are they? Cambridge had a very remarkable institution that doesn't really have equivalents anywhere else. Uh, the Cambridge apostles uh, were, are, because it still exists, a society uh, of extreme intellectual exclusivity. It dates back to the 19th century. It was an intellectual discussion society. Members would meet, uh, give papers, be brilliant, eat sardines on toast. That's about it. Doesn't sound like much, does it? But it was really and remains one of the most prestigious societies that one could be elected to.
and the process of election was an arduous one. Uh, only rarely were elections made, so the, the apostles remained relatively few in number. It was probably at the height of its intellectual influence in the 1910s and 1920s when John Maynard Keynes, certainly the most influential economist of the 20th century, was a member, uh, along with his friend Lytton Strachey, one of the great iconoclastic uh, writers of that generation. And they looked down from a great height on everybody else. They regarded themselves, not without some cause, as very clever indeed. You write, they were, in a word, insufferable. They were pretty insufferable. Actually, reading the younger Keynes's correspondence of this subject makes you realise that a very exclusive network has a kind of nasty side to it. It was quite misogynistic. Uh, the, the apostles of the early 1900s certainly tended gay. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But the kind of misogyny that, kept, that accompanied that particular... Uh, chapter in, in, in Cambridge history doesn't look well today. But they were primarily an intellectual uh, group. One interesting consequence of their elitism, and that's the only word for it, was a disdain for all the conventional wisdom that Britain had inherited from the Victorians. Uh, so if you are the creme de la creme intellectually, naturally you're far too clever to believe in free trade or the gold standard or any of the things that the Victorians believed in, the British Empire. So the interesting thing about the Apostles was that by the 1920s they were questioning most of the conventional wisdom of the previous generation. But what then happened, and this is really why I write about the Apostles in the book, was something surprising. They got hacked by the Russians. Uh, sounds rather like a contemporary problem, there's nothing new under the sun. The Soviet uh, intelligence agency, the KGB, had a very ingenious strategy uh, in the 1930s. And that ingenious strategy was to try to recruit agents, operatives, from within the commanding heights of the English establishment. And they hit on the idea, a man named Deutsch was the agent who did this, of recruiting at Cambridge and trying to get members of the Apostles. And they succeeded so that at least three of the Cambridge spies were members of the Apostles, including Guy Burgess. And this was probably the most successful intelligence operation of the 20th century, in the sense that by getting these recruits from the exclusive intellectual elite, they got access to key institutions in the British establishment, including the intelligence services and the Foreign Office. And they had really high calibre people uh, on the payroll supplying intelligence from the British government to Moscow in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. Uh, and the quality and quantity of the intelligence were astonishing. So what does this illustrate? Well. It illustrates one important feature of networks. They're not very good at defending themselves. The Apostles didn't really ever consider the possibility that the KGB would penetrate them and actually recruit members of the society to work for Soviet intelligence. But it happened. And it proved an enormous vulnerability for Western intelligence in the early phase of the Cold War, as well as in World War II. Uh, it took a great deal of effort to expose the Cambridge spies. Why was it so difficult? Was it because they were incredibly good at covering their tracks? No. They actually made lots of mistakes that should have given them away. But because they were who they were, because they had the, the seal of approval of not just Cambridge University, not just Trinity College, but the Apostles, people found it impossible to believe that they would be spies. And that credibility that they had from their network and the protection that they enjoyed from other members of the network it explains why the Cambridge spies were able to operate for so long and took so long to be detected and so long to be exposed. You also talk about the Bloom, <coughs> excuse me, the Bloomsbury <coughs> group and I want to read this long couple of sentences because it's you talk about networking. <coughs> you have to describe some of these people later. As with the Apostles, it was once again sexual relationships that defined the network. Grant slept not only with Keynes, 
Lytton Strachey, Adrian Stevens, <clears throat> and Vanessa Bell, but also with David Garnett. Vanessa Bell slept not only with Grant, but also with Roger Fry, and sometimes even her own husband, Clive. <laughs> Kane slept with Grant, Garnett, Strachey, and eventually the Russian ballerina Lydia Lopakova. Or Lopaka, Lopakova. So what in the world is that all about? Because there are men and women, women sleeping with men, women sleeping with men, and all that. What? Give, give us the background. The Bloomsbury that. Group were very advanced <coughs> in their sexuality. Who were they? Uh, well, they were connected socially with the apostles. Keynes was a member of both groups. Bloomsbury was a looser grouping, uh, really of, uh, of intellectuals and artists and uh, writers who, who, once they had left Cambridge and, and moved to London, uh, initially uh, lived in housing in the Bloomsbury district of, of London. And it was a social <coughs> group. Uh, its impact on, on the history of English modernism was enormous. Uh, but I think what's fascinating about the group as a social network, as, as you've just uh, described, is this curious complexity of their sexual relationships with one another, with Keynes as a bisexual having relationships with both men and women. This sounds quite modern. You could probably do a network graph of Hollywood in the recent past that might look a little bit like this. But the reason for analysing the network is that it was so influential and people still uh, think of Virginia Woolf as one of the most important figures uh, of British literature in the 20th century. She was very much part of, of, of Bloomsbury, just as Keynes was a, a towering figure in, in economics. These, these people shaped modernism in, in Britain and their influence was certainly felt across the Atlantic in the United States. I think what made them impactful was not just that they as individuals were very talented, though they definitely were, it was the fact that the network, Bloomsbury Network, projected the talent and promoted uh, the talent through publishing, uh, through the media, and with Keynes ultimately in government. because. Keynes became really a very important civil servant in the First and Second World Wars. So networks matter because that they, they can take an important individual and, and force multiply, as we might say today. Uh, their influence as individuals was significantly enhanced by their membership of, of the network. No man is an island. That's uh, an old observation that goes all the way back to John Donne, the 17th century poet. Uh, one sees in the square and the tower how, how very important this is, that even the most towering genius, and there's no question that Keynes had a phenomenal intellect, is embedded in some sense in, in a social network. And some networks are just more effective than others. And Bloomsbury was very effective at advancing its collective interests, its collective commitment to modernism, to the great challenge to Victorian ideas that, that was so important in the 20th century. Let me put up on the screen a, <coughs> excuse me, a picture of the tower and the square and tell us why you named your book that and where this tower and square is. You'll see it on that screen. The, uh, the title of a book is an important thing because uh, without uh, the right title, your, your book may, may fail. And if I'd called the book networks and hierarchies, we probably wouldn't be sitting here because that's kind of a turn-off title. I was racking my brains for a better title than networks and hierarchies and suddenly remembered Siena. Now, your viewers will include people who have been to that lovely Italian town and who will have walked around the Piazza del Campo and they will have stood in the shadow of the Torre del Mangia. This is a perfect juxtaposition of the two central ideas this book is about. In the town square in the piazza, the Sienese mingle, meet, exchange, trade, even engage in horse races. But it's the realm of social networks. There's nothing structured about what happens there except maybe the horse race. In the tower and the Palazzo Publico which it's attached to, that's where hierarchical structures of governance existed. When it was a republic, Siena was run out of the Palazzo Publico. That's where power resides. And power tends to be hierarchically structured. 
even C-SPAN probably has an org chart and at the top of the org chart there will be the chief executive or president or whatever the title is and as you go down the org chart you'll find yourself uh, and that's how most organizations and certainly most governments are constructed hierarchically networks have a completely different architecture they don't necessarily have somebody at the top if you want you can think of them as being horizontal flat whereas governments states hierarchies are vertical uh, so the square and the tower is about the relationship between these two forms of organization the square where social networks reside and the tower where hierarchical orders of, of governance reside go back to you for a moment where do you live now I now live in Northern California not far from the Stanford campus uh, what do you do in Northern California. I'm a fellow of the Hoover Institution, uh, which is part of Stanford University, and uh, uh, so I spend my days at the heart of the Stanford campus, though I'm mostly engaged in research now, I'm not teaching. I want to show you some video of somebody you're very close to, uh, an individual you know very well, and tell us how this person fits into your life. There is something within Islam inherent in Islam that inspires, incites, and mobilizes millions of people to engage in what our president euphemistically calls non-violent, no, he calls it violent extremism. That was in 2015 during the Obama administration. Who is that lady? That is my wife, Ayan Hersi Ali, uh, who has spent uh, most of the last, let's see, 17 years uh, thinking, writing, and, and talking about the problem of Islamic extremism and uh, the difficulty that we have and have had since 9-11 in dealing with networks of, of terrorism of, of violence but also networks of she used the phrase inadvertently there non-violent extremism the networks that preach radical ideas without necessarily putting them into practice those non-violent extremists are in some ways the necessary precondition for the violent extremists people don't just go straight to terrorism they have usually been radicalized beforehand so my wife works on this incredibly important subject. These terrorist networks kill a lot of people every year, tens of thousands around the world. And she's a very courageous uh, woman. Uh, she's my heroine. She combines uh, brilliance with bravery and beauty. And I'm the luckiest man you've ever interviewed because I'm married to her. How many children do you have? She and I have two children. I have uh, three older children by my first marriage. Uh, so I have a grand total of five. You say in your book that you thought maybe by the time the book was published you would have another Campbell in yes. the family. Do you have another Campbell in the family? Happily that came true. Uh, our youngest son was born uh, last October. Why a Campbell? Why did you care? My father's name was Campbell. Uh, my father died a couple of years ago when we heard the wonderful news that Ayan was pregnant. It seemed suddenly self-evident when we knew it was uh, a boy. Though, of course, we could have called uh, her a girl if she'd been a girl, because Campbell seems to be one of these names that works well for both sexes. But for me, it will always be a male name, because that was Dad's name. Uh, it suddenly seemed obvious that we should call our son Campbell. How long have you been married to her, and how, uh, what did network have to do with marriage? Oh, what's her? a good question. Well, we'll be celebrating our uh, seventh anniversary uh, this year. Uh, we met in New York City, uh, and I'll remember it uh, as long as I live, it was the depths of the financial crisis. And I'd been invited by a particular network to give a speech. Uh, the network in question was a thing called the Mont Pelerin Society, which is essentially a network of economists who have a free market leaning. Originally originated in the post-war period and was uh, founded by the economist uh, Friedrich Hayek, Keynes's nemesis, Keynes's arch rival. I was invited to give a speech about the financial crisis uh, and to answer the question, 
was this crisis the fault of the free market? The kind of question you would be worried about in early 2009 if you were an economist of that persuasion. I agreed. I was in a rather low point in my own life, going through a divorce. What, what did I have to lose uh, to get out of Cambridge and go to New York? Uh, by sheer good luck, uh, Ayan, who had left the Netherlands, where she'd been a member of parliament, after uh, the security situation there became intolerable for her, had become a fellow of the American Enterprise Institute and was living in the United States, came to that same meeting uh, as a fellow of the American Enterprise Institute. And there we met. We were introduced by a delightful Australian friend, Greg Lindsay. Uh, if you've read War and Peace, you'll remember the moment Pierre sees Natasha and everything stops. I had that moment that night in the Union League Club in New York. Clubs are important in the history of networks and the Union League Club is a venerable New York club. There we all were, supposedly to talk about the financial crisis. The only thought that I had in my mind that night, even as I was speaking about the financial crisis, was how on earth I could get Ayan Hersey Ali's phone number. She gave it to you that night? I may have taken a little longer. But is, we got there. Has, is there still a fatwa issued against her? Yes, in that death threats continue to be made. Uh, Does she have to be physically protected by security? Yes. And does she live out with you in Northern California? One of the things they tell you about security is not to discuss your security. Uh, suffice to say, because she is a former Muslim, an apostate, who speaks out against uh, the extremists. She has faced recurrent death threats. The most spectacular was when Theo van Gogh was murdered in the streets of Amsterdam when they were working on a film together and on uh, van Gogh's body was pinned a note by his murderer saying that Ayan would be next. But these threats of violence uh, have been a recurrent feature of her life since then and Therefore, we cannot drop our guard. We have to assume that there is a risk. After Charlie Hebdo, after the murders of uh, Stéphane Chabonnier, the editor of the satirical uh, French magazine, we had to be redouble our vigilance because Ayan's name is on the same list of 11 people uh, that was published by Al-Qaeda in 2013 under the heading, A Bullet for Allah. So this is no laughing matter for us. The threat is a very real one and we have to take uh, all the precautions we can to keep her and our, our sons safe. I'm not just sure I'm pronouncing this correctly, but is Tsinghua University still something that you're associated with? Yes, I go <coughs> to China a couple of times a year to Tsinghua, uh, which is uh, the, one of the two big universities in Beijing. For me, the, the there are two huge questions that historians in the future will, will have to grapple with uh, when they write about our time. One of them is the problem of Islamic extremism and the violence associated with it, this, this fundamental problem of how does Islam adapt or not to modernity, and the other is the rise of China. And uh, while Ayan has devoted so much of her life to understanding the, the Islam problem, I, I see myself as able to contribute more to the question of China's rise. So I think one can only really understand this by, by going there. I wish I were a better educated man. I do not speak the language, but I have spent a lot of the last 10 years trying to understand uh, modern China better. And since I'm by training an economic historian, it, and it is a fundamentally an economic question, uh, it preoccupies me a, a good deal. It, are you involved with the Schwarzman College? Yes. And the reason I bring it up, because <clears throat> I looked up the advisory committee of the Schwarzman College, and it just seemed to me to be one of the great networks that Absolutely. you could possibly put together. And I'm going to read down the list. Yes. Sarkozy, Tony Blair, Brian Mulrooney, Kevin Rudd from Australia, Henry Kissinger, Colin Powell, Hank Paulson, Jim Wolfenson, Bob Rubin, Condi Rice, Rick Levin, who used to be the president of Yale, Richard Haas, the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, yo, yo, yo Yo Ma and others, if I were an outsider looking in, I'd say that's one of, that's <clears throat> the Illuminati, it's uh, <laughs> Council on Foreign Relations, it's uh, and 
What does that mean? Yeah. Well, it means that Steve Schwartzman, who's uh, the, the the brains and the money behind the, the, the Schwartzman College, has the Rolodex of Rolodexes. Uh, and Steve was able to bring this group together, uh, as well as lesser fry like me to do the teaching. There are two points that I think one can make. The first is that clearly there is an enormously important network, uh, and you've just listed a, some of the key nodes in that network. You could find similar names, similar combinations of names, if you went to the World Economic Forum or the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, or you just hung out in New York uh, and the Four Seasons. This is a, a real elite network, and it is, uh, it's, it's, it's very important to recognize that it exists and is not dreamt up by conspiracy theorists. It's not an invention. These mostly men know one another. Second point, this is an elite that seems, in this case, to be trying its best to do something that I think is good, namely to build uh, a new kind of network that connects China to the West. The Sch Schwarzman Scholarship Program was dreamt up by Steve as a kind of version of uh, the Rhodes Scholarships, which used to, to bring people to Oxford, still bring people to study in Oxford. And, and the Steve Schwarzman vision was, well, we need to do something similar so that there is more understanding between the future leaders of China and the future leaders of Western countries. I think that's a very good idea. I think the program is a terrific innovation. And I see when I go there, terrific students from all around the world, not just Americans, it's from all around the world, getting to understand China better and studying alongside Chinese students at uh, what is the equivalent of, of MIT or, or, or Harvard in, in, in China. Have you been to the Bilderberg meetings? Yes. Have you been a member of the Trilateral Commission? No. Barney Miller, the television show. This is a 42 second clip, 1981 when, when it was when this happened, and this is, a tel this is just a television show. Let's run. All right, what is the Trilateral Commission? <laughs> it's an organization founded in 1973 by David Rockefeller to bring together business and political leaders from the United States, Europe, Japan, so they could work together for uh, better economic and political cooperation between their nations. And with that, that's what they'd like us to believe. But you see, what they're really up to is a scheme to plant their own loyal members in positions of power in this country, to work to erase national boundaries and create an international community, and in time, bring about a one-world government with David Rockefeller calling the shots. <laughs> Sir, what do you think? Well, there you have the conspiracy theory uh, that we were talking about earlier, that uh, they say they're meeting in order to improve the world and improve economic policy coordination, but actually they're hatching a plan to erase national boundaries and establish world government under David Rockefeller. So the stated objectives are, are, are the objectives, and the notion that there is going to be a world government at the end of it is the fantasy. Uh, now, I can't speak for the Trilateral Commission, I'm not involved with that, but I, I can assure you that uh, although the meetings of the Bilderberg group are closed, uh, nobody ever mentioned world government to me uh, at those meetings. Uh, on the contrary, I'm always struck by the extent to which at such gatherings, the discussion is reactive. You know, here's another fine mess the world is in. Is there anything we can do about it? You don't have a strong sense of of there being control. Uh, even the word power seems strangely inappropriate. This network is, is commenting on the world, exchanging ideas. Uh, I'm sure there's an element of, uh, of business involved too, but we shouldn't exaggerate the power of even the most exclusive networks. What's striking to me when I interact with these groups is not their power, but often their sense of powerlessness. If you think about the events of, of 2016, just to take an example, uh, not many members of the supposed world government planned that Britain would vote to leave the European Union and that Donald Trump would become president of the United States. Donald Trump is definitely not somebody who gets invited to those meetings. So 
then, or for example, take, take the financial crisis, the events of 2008-9. Nobody sat there at the Bilderberg meeting in 2008 saying, I think what we really need for the world government is a massive financial crisis. No, what's striking when you spend time in these rarefied circles uh, is the, the lack of power. Influence, yes. These people, the people who are involved with the Schwarzman College, are very influential people. But I think that power tends to be exaggerated, and uh, if there is a world government uh, being put together, it's not, doing, it's not doing very well, it's not going very well. But I don't think that's ever been the project. It's interesting actually to mention David Rockefeller. I read the other day that, that Rockefeller, whose network predated the age of the internet and existed on a giant Rolodex, was one of the biggest networks of probably of all time in the sense that with the limits of technology, there's only so many people that you can keep a tab on. And 100,000 names, I seem to remember, were in this giant system of index cards, including some of the names that you read. Certainly Henry Kissinger was in that list. I'm in the midst of writing Kissinger's biography. And for me, part of the way to understand Kissinger's rise from being a, an academic and a public intellectual to being an extraordinarily influential uh, Secretary of State is to understand that network to understand the ways in which it worked so that his influence extended beyond government, extended across borders, was in many ways global. To me this is historically very interesting, but one has to talk about it and write about it without exaggerating the power of the network. The influence, yes, but I think the power was more circumscribed, much as was true in the case of the Rothschild Bank, which I wrote about back in the 1990s. Yes, the Rothschilds were probably the richest people in the world in the 19th century, and their banks were tremendously influential in the way that the bond market evolved and therefore in the way that governments could borrow. But at the time, conspiracy theorists said that they had total power over the world, that they determined whether there was war or whether there was peace, that they controlled the central banks, etc. Well, I showed in my book, The World's Banker, that, that that was mostly untrue, that the Rothschilds couldn't determine war and peace and very often would be uh, frustrated and uh, would suffer losses when wars broke out. So I think the challenge for the historian who wants to write about networks is striking that balance between delineating the influence, trying to measure it and calibrate it, and also identifying the limits of, of the network's power. Fourteen years ago, Henry Hertzberg was here. Uh, he had a book. He had been a speechwriter in Jimmy Carter's administration, spent time, lots of time after that at the New Yorker magazine. And this comment that he made near the, in the middle of the interview has always stayed with me. Uh, it's kind of the reverse of what you, we're talking about when it comes to conspiracy. This is, I asked him the question, when you were in the White House, what's the one thing that you brought out that you didn't expect? And here is his answer from 2004. You realize how little, how there really isn't anybody in charge, that these are just human beings, that I believe before I went there that somewhere up there, there was somebody in charge, that really, you know, the things were being taken care of. And uh, I don't think this is just Carter. I think this is true of every White House. You learn that it's just people up there, and they're not that different from the people you know. What do you think? I think that's about right. One of the great illusions uh, of American journalism, especially at the moment, is that it's all about the president, who has a quasi-monarchical power, and whose every whim and action and, and tweet determines the fate of nations. One uh, way of thinking about the presidency is to think of it as as a network. The White House itself is a collection of people working together. The president's the most important node in the network, but he, he simply can't rule alone. He's not an absolute monarch. So in a recent article that was published in The Atlantic, I and my uh, co-author for this piece, uh, Manny Rincon Cruz, did some network analysis of three administrations. We didn't look at Carter's. We, we looked at Nixon's uh, and we looked at Bill Clinton's and we looked at Donald Trump's and we simply tried to map the network of power because the structure of politics is as important as the personality of the president especially in a republic.
And what was striking was that the similarities leapt out between Trump's administration and Bill Clinton's in the first year. And Nixon's looked quite different. Uh, partly because Nixon was a rather reclusive president who liked to sit in his study with his yellow notepad and hated interacting with people. Whereas both Bill Clinton and Donald Trump are outgoing personalities who like to be in the room where it happens. So network analysis is a really quite important tool for helping us understand the structure of politics. It's not that there's no there there. Clearly there is, uh, there is power in the White House, but it is not entirely vested in the president. The president cannot act without his, uh, his advisors, without his chief of staff, his gatekeeper, without his cabinet, the people running the major departments. And I think there is a tendency in American journalism increasingly to talk about the presidency as if it's a monarchy. And this is a mistake because it doesn't work that way. Uh, and I think anybody who enters the realm of power, as Henry Kissinger did in 1969 when he went to work for Richard Nixon, discovers uh, that it's very different from the way they imagined it and that this structure of this network around the president is really the key. Uh, it was something that Kissinger worked out very quickly for himself. Uh, not everybody figures this out. And I think part of what happens in the first year of any administration is a certain churn, as those people who were perhaps terrific on the campaign enter the realm of power and find they can't make it work. I mean, Steve Bannon comes to mind in the case of the, of the Trump White House. But there were similar figures who had come in with Clinton, had been part of Clinton's campaign and, and, and did not really go the distance. So I think this is a fascinating way of thinking about politics and a, a really valuable corrective in an age when the personality of the president, I think, is given far too much importance. Uh, we picked this up from one of your footnotes. And uh, it's somebody he's born in Sweden uh, he has a followship on YouTube of 60 million people his name is Pootie Pie and anybody watching this is going to think we've just gone off our rails here but let's <laughs> give you 23 seconds of what people are drawn to on the YouTube and then you can explain how that fits in the book <laughs> Welcome to another video! Tap, 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 tap. <sighs> I'm sick. Which is okay because I wanted to make this chill video for quite some time, showing off my figurine collection. There's a lot more where that came from. Far too much. Why? Why is this important? <sighs> Why did he make it into the footnotes? Well, the phenomenon of YouTube stars that you and I have never heard of is in itself interesting. Uh, it's a young person's genre, uh, and young people consume a lot of content via YouTube, the Google-owned online TV channel, like that. Uh, what would seem to uh, old guys like us, uh, like banal self-indulgence, has tremendous uh, support and interest. Uh, people spend a lot of time watching this stuff and a lot of people do it. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us that the structure of the public sphere where ideas are exchanged has changed radically in our time. We've gone from a world of TV networks, uh, which are relatively centrally controlled things, where decisions are made about content from up high and that's how a TV network has always worked, to a new kind of network which is exemplified by YouTube, but one could also say the same of, of, of Facebook, in which there's a great, less, a great deal less centralization uh, of decision-making. PewDiePie went viral, acquired an enormous numbers of, a number of followers by posting videos uh, without any plan, I think, or, or any direction from on high. It just happened. It went viral because his inane banter captured a certain mood at the time, and the veering between inanity and occasionally the controversial has a great appeal, it would seem. Inexplicable though I find it. So in understanding the public sphere of, the, of, of our time, 
older people like us have to make an effort to realize that new things are happening that are qualitatively different from what we're accustomed to when it comes to the generation of content. Content is being thrown out and in a strange evolutionary process, uh, some of it goes viral. Why, does, why did he go viral? Why did he become so much more followed than presumably a whole bunch of other teenagers and 20-somethings who were posting their videos and going nowhere? It's impossible to say because it's not really about the content. Things often go viral just because they enter the network at the right point. Remember the network is a whole complex of nodes, some of which are better connected than others. And if a very well connected person who already has a lot of followers says, I like this PewDiePie video, then suddenly that video can go viral, even if its content is rather vacuous. That is the new world that we live in. Now, it's decentralized in the sense that Eric Schmidt at Google didn't say, we need somebody to do inane videos. He's got to wear headphones and have a beard and let's make the, back, the background pink. Nobody ever made that decision. Nobody gave that command at Google. In that sense, the content is spontaneously generated by the users. But then the Google and YouTube algorithms determine the readiness with which you will find that content through the search engine. The search engine ranks everything, and it tends to rank it not only by popularity, by the number of people who viewed it, but also by your you as an individual, your preferences as a user, a user which Google and YouTube know from your past behavior. So we now are in a new world in which algorithms responsive to each individual user's behavior decide what gets ranked in search. That is a completely different model for the public sphere than anything we've seen in the past. And most people, certainly most people aged older than 30 or 40, and certainly if you're in your 50s like me, struggle to understand this. In your chapter on Kissinger, and you've already talked about, you wrote a book already about him. You're writing, volume one is done, volume yeah. two is pending. Okay. This quote, and then I want to show you some video from 1975. The best illustration of Kissinger's argument was the abject failure of U.S. strategy in Vietnam. Here is Henry Kissinger in 75. I have always considered Indochina a disaster, perhaps partly because we did not think through the implications of what we were doing at the beginning. Does we mean and you included? Well, or, or I Pre, uh, pre my uh, uh, being in office. If he thought it was a disaster, why didn't he get us out of there right after the election? Well, that's a question for volume two. So I should probably hold by fire because I'm still plowing through an answer? I mean, mountain I, of material. Volume, well, volume historians did? should definitely do their research <clears throat> and, and their thinking before they come up with answers. I can give you a <laughs> hypothetical. First thing, uh, to say is that it's true that Kissinger identified it as a disaster in the late 60s. He went there, I show this in volume one, uh, on a series of, of trips uh, and saw at first hand, I think the first was in 65 or 66, 66 I think, saw at first hand what was going wrong. And what was going wrong is relevant to this book because here was the great hierarchical entity called the US government intervening in the war between North and South Vietnam and failing completely to understand the networks, like the Viet Cong, that were going to be so hard, ultimately impossible to defeat. So it was a collision between a very hierarchical military that had essentially continued to operate on the same basis as in the Korean War and in World War II, with a command structure that was super centralized. This hierarchy could not win the Vietnam War. I think that that's the the key observation. And Kissinger understood that. His notes back from the late 60s of his trips to Vietnam make it clear that he identified the fundamental pathology of the American intervention. The second question is, was there some extremely easy way for the United States to exit in January 1969 when he as National Security Advisor entered the White House? And I think, hypothesis to be decided as I as I write volume two, that nobody at the time seriously believed that you could just up sticks and leave when the scale of the American presence was, was at its peak. I mean, 
had been escalated by Lyndon Johnson. So what did they do? What they did was radically and rapidly to reduce the US military presence. I and mean, the Nixon administration Vietnamizes the conflict and the numbers of troops are dramatically and rapidly reduced. And at the time, I think Kissinger had his doubts about that. It wasn't his policy. At the time, the belief was you could do that and at the same time use air power, use bombing to force the North Vietnamese to the negotiating table and secure a diplomatic resolution. At the time, that did not seem like such a crazy strategy. And it was only really a relatively radical fringe of campus leftists who made it seem simple, as in, let's just stop the war and come home. No decision makers, including amongst Democrats, and the Democrats had after all got the US into the war, were arguing for simply cutting and running. The whole question was, how can you, how can you downsize the involvement, how can you arrive at peace? And I think that's how Kissinger thought, thought I mean, of the problem. Uh, when's that book going to be out? Ooh, now you're asking a difficult question. Within three years. Let, let me ask you one thing, that you, and you start off writing about this. The archives, uh, the historical archives, hagiography, and um, hierarchy, and the way history is written that you don't like. Well, I think historians tend to go where the archives are, where the sources are, and sources tend to be in archives produced by hierarchical organizations like governments. I mean, that's just the way the world is ordered. Governments have understood since the beginnings of written record that power is in written records. That is how you understand the business of government, refer back to the decisions of previous governments. So historians naturally go to archives. That's where the data, the sources are. The problem is that the social networks that have played such a huge part in history don't have an archives department that you can just go and consult. How are you avoiding that then, this is the last question, with the Kissinger biographies? Doing my best not only to look at multiple governments, after all diplomacy is about governments, so I'm looking at as many governments as possible to the point of uh, overwhelming myself with material, but also then looking at the records of the student movement. The most important variable in the Vietnam War was in many ways the opposition to it within the United States. And that was a network of campus radicals who were anti-war, but were also anti a whole bunch of other things. Uh, there was a whole range of issues that they were mobilized about, but the op opposition to the war was the key organizing issue. So I want to study that network. It ultimately circumscribed what Nixon and Kissinger were able to do in ways that at the beginning, I think they underestimated. So all history needs to be at once the history of hierarchies, of governments, of corporations, and of networks, of those informally organized things, like the anti-war movement, which didn't really have a leader. You know, Who do you call if you want to speak to the anti-war movement? Nixon at one point goes out and tries to talk to the protesters. You know, he, he goes out earnestly and meets with them uh, in Washington. And it's a non-meeting of minds. Kissinger, who'd been a professor, understood better the futility of this endeavor. But there's, there's something to me very poignant about the President of the United States, who stands at the very top of the most hierarchical of all structures, the federal government of the United States, going out and trying to connect with a bunch of hippie anti-war protesters, trying to establish some connection, believing that he could somehow persuade them to see that he was trying to end the war. And Kissinger's like, what did you expect? Out of time. Our guest has been Neil Ferguson. The book is called The Square and the Tower, Networks and Power from the Freemasons to Facebook. We thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.